a little quiet. I'm really <laughs> thrilled because we have a great conversation ahead and not too much time for it because, as Linda pointed out, we're what stands between you and a great reception and we take that very seriously. Um, but this is an important conversation. Um, certified community behavioral health centers are making a big difference in a lot of states in how people who need mental health service can, uh, can have access to them. And we're going to learn a lot because we have, we're starting with three really well-informed, experienced experts. I'll introduce them to you in a minute. And then standing by are two power figures in Maryland mental health policy to respond to this conversation. So we're going to pack a whole lot in. Let me introduce to you um, our panelists. Joe Parks, MD, currently serves as medical director of the National Council for Mental Well-Being and is a distinguished research professor of science at Missouri Institute of Mental Health. He also practices outpatient psychiatry at Family Health Center, a federally funded community health center. His government service included, includes decades of leading Missouri Medicaid and the Missouri Department of Mental Health. Joe Parks is a national leader in efforts to transform the delivery of behavioral health services. He's received numerous awards for his leadership for improving quality of care. Valerie Hune is the director of the Missouri Department of Mental Health, where she oversees the operation and expansion of Missouri's certified community behavioral health clinics. Valerie Hune is a vast background in state government. She served as director of the Division of Developmental Disabilities, as well as a budget and planning analyst, and in various leadership roles in the Missouri Departments of Health and senior services. And many of you know Jeff Richardson. He is the Vice President and Chief <laughs> Operating Officer for Shepherd Pratt's community-based behavioral health programs. And he brings more than three decades of behavioral health experience to this more role. More than three, yes. Jeff Richardson <laughs> serves on multiple nonprofit boards, state task forces, and academic positions, including past chair of the board of the National Council for Mental Well-Being, an honorary life board member of the Mental Health Association of Maryland. So would you please welcome our panelists. <laughs> Joe Parks, I want to start with you. Um, I discovered cleaning out my very messy office <laughs> proof this Joe. Oh, excuse me. Proof, Joe, <laughs> that you were here 11 years ago. I admit it. Um, <laughs> to tell us about an inside look at Missouri's behavioral health home. In other words, how to use financing to drive delivery of care in a better direction. You were a division director in the Missouri Department of Mental Health. Take us inside how this approach, certified community behavioral health clinics, how did this get started and why? This is really the next evolution beyond behavioral health homes. The next step into a more advanced payment system and a more advanced array. What is a, community a certified community behavioral health center? It is a standard definition of what it is to be a community mental health center. This is the first time we've had a standard definition in federal regs since 1980. So you know what you're getting. It's defined in 114 certification criteria. It's a comprehensive array of services because many people we serve have multiple needs. They have substance use disorder, they have mental illness, they have physical health needs, and these are all required to be attended to and to see that people get uh, the care they need in the certification standards. It is a payment mechanism that is sufficient to pay the actual cost. You know, with traditional fee-for-service, I can guarantee you one thing. There are some people you're overpaying and there's some people you're underpaying because the costs in Annapolis are not the same as the costs of delivering care in Cumberland. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so this is data-driven care. Both the finance is data-driven because it's based on an individual detailed line-by-line -line cost report. So you know what you're buying and the providers can compare against each other what it's costing them and then they get better. They become better business people, they know their business better and they learn from each other because of the standard cost report. 
It is data driven because there are over two dozen performance measures. Accountability is by how good the outcomes are, not just by counting how many units of service. Better accountability than in fee for service. But those standards are what really make it. You get increased access. You have to have weekend hours. You have to have prompt access. 50% see people the same day they show up. You talked about 988, and it's great to have an access point. But an access point is no good unless there's treatment standing behind it. Otherwise, you're just waiting for the next crisis. But to get that crisis system, CCBHCs have to have mobile crisis. They have to have 24-7 mm -hmm. hotlines. They have to have urgent prompt access to care. They are actually a way of reducing the load on your 988 system because when people can get in promptly, they don't end up having a crisis and calling 988. It is full age range of service, adult to elderly, includes veterans. It is a comprehensive array for a wide number of people and the big thing we've seen it do nationally is increase access. 25% more people getting access to service, and that's what everybody's struggling with nationally. You're not the only one. It's the waiting list. Any waiting list for service is a waiting list for another crisis. So that's CCBHC. Standardized evidence-based services that are comprehensive, data-driven accountability that improves financial business ability and improves clinical ability. Wow, that's a tour de force answer. I was afraid we wouldn't cover a lot, but you just did. I want to. I, I wanna just thought everybody should know what the thing is we're talking about. Right. I, I, I couldn't agree more, and we're going to unpack more of it. But I want to turn to Jeff Richardson because you were part of that discussion 11 years ago. The part of the program, that part of the program was headlined "Behavioral Health Change on the Horizon." How has Maryland done moving in the direction Joe was talking about that day? Well, you start off by saying I've been doing this work for over 30 years. I'm sorry. And I can, I can imagine how many cycles of change that we've talked about anticipating in the state with mental health. <laughs> and I think I, I want to just tie onto what the governor said right before we got here, which is we are full of hope. We have so much opportunity here, and we are so excited about it. But I can tell you we are struggling as, a, as an industry right now. It is nearly catetic on how starving many of our programs are in terms of wanting to meet the need for people and being able to provide access to care but not having the resources to do it. So access is growing, but our resources to do it are dwindling. Uh, we, we in Maryland have five right now active CCBHC grant pro providers, but these are grants that last for two years. And when that second year ends, so goes those resources. So goes the ability to provide that access that Joe talked about. So goes the, the tremendous opportunities for, for opening our doors regardless of ability to pay. All of that stops if we don't act on this. And so I just want to say before anything, the time is now. The time is now to do this. If we have the resources and the momentum, this is the right place and the right time. The, the things that we have experienced as an organization at Shepherd, uh, in terms of this program specifically, it has opened up more access to people. It has allowed us to be able to provide care to people, particularly people who are struggling with both men severe mental illness, but also medical needs, providing significant access. And the, the remarkable um, stories about how people have been healthy and successful are great. The other thing is we've saved money for the state in terms of the services provided. People have stayed out of hospitals and gotten health care and health coordination that's been critical. The other thing that we don't talk a lot about with this program, which is different, is that many of us who've been doing this work a long time, we get f typically funded for that encounter when somebody comes into our office. And when they leave, that's where it ends. The benefit to this program is it's allowed us to continue those points of access into the criminal justice system, which the governor was just talking about. Critical access in, um, into these programs from that way. Uh, veterans, which we are, we are seeing a large uptick in terms of services for veterans that didn't have access to care because of this program. Uh, and, and frankly, Mar Maryland should be proud of what we've been able to do with the five all across the state of Maryland CCBHCs. But the they're going to end. The, the five. five pilots. But they will end. And when they end, so goes all of this momentum and all of these initiatives if we don't take this initiative now to move forward with it. 
Valerie, now you are director of behavioral <laughs> health in Missouri, but your involvement in this goes back much further. How, how did you get started on this path? Well, I actually was uh, in the state budget office. I was the assistant state budget director when we decided to become a demonstration state in 2014. We're nine years into this right now. And in 2014, we knew what all of you know is at a budget office, you know they're gonna come to you and they're gonna say, oh, we're gonna save you money <laughs> and we're gonna increase access and we're gonna increase care and it's gonna be better for everybody. But, and you're gonna get this enhanced federal match for a few years and then you'll have to pick that up at the end. And so if you're doing that math on the back of an envelope in a budget office, we use spreadsheets in Missouri. Um, but if you're doing that, <laughs> If you're doing that, you're thinking, how am I gonna pay for this program in, at that point in time, it was gonna be fiscal year 2020. Um, we're still operating under the enhanced federal match rate in Missouri, so our demonstration has continued because of changes in the federal government, in, in federal law to keep us in that, in that enhanced match rate. But that's where I got started, and that, that was the conversations we had. And we were with a group of folks that had been trying to fund solutions for a behavioral health crisis with straight general revenue in our, in our state. So we were funding emergency room diversion with straight general revenue. We were not getting any match rates for that. We were funding um, crisis intervention centers with straight general revenue. All of that stuff, youth behavior, youth uh, school-based interventions, all of that was being funded with straight general revenue. And what CCBHO allowed us to do was actually fold all of those straight general revenue funding items into this rate and they have a responsibility for access to everyone. They get paid for the encounter, but they expand their services so broadly. Just so you know, my kids are in sports. I don't go to a single school in the state and use the bathroom and I don't see a 988 sign. So when you said, whoever said that the kids don't know about 988, they know about it in Missouri because our CCBHOs are in all of our schools and they are spreading that message, so. Joe. You, you threw a lot at us, but I'm not sure I really understand. What does a CCBHC look like? And so, yeah. Did yeah. It is, a, it is both a clinic and it is services in the community. So it, you, you can see your people in clinic. You can see them in the community. It could be services in the school. It is. It can be services in your county jail. It can be services in the general hospital ER. It can be services in the person's home. So since the needs are diverse and the people are diverse, what it looks like is pretty diverse too. But what it is is a group of professionals that are practicing and running their business based on data so they know how well they're doing day over day and compared to each other, which means you can improve it. It's hard to improve things you can't measure. And this stuff you can measure so you can improve it. And the other thing it is, is it's cost effective. Did it run over budget, Val? I promised you I was not going to no, run over your budget. No, you didn't run over budget. And we pay on the, the quality, and not everybody gets a quality improvement payment because yeah. we have the data for it. The other thing about it is not everybody can be a CCBHC. No. You have to get certified by the state. You get reviewed and say, yes, you are good enough to do that, but you don't have all the services I need yet. Try again later. And if they get worse and stop performing, you can remove that certification. Another way to hold it accountable. In that way, it's more accountable than many other of the services you're paying for right now. So, Jeff Richardson, what kind of hoops did you have to go through to be certified as a behavioral health clinic? As a grantee versus the full goal that we're going for here, what we went through is certification through SAMHSA. So SAMHSA had a national standard, meaning it wasn't something we pulled out of the air and said, yeah, you know, let's do this and we'll see if we're okay with it. The, the, the goal that Joe brought up earlier in this program, it is a national standard. It gives a national basis for the delivery of these, this care. So if you're in any of these states across the U.S., that same level of standards would be expected in Maryland, in Missouri, Oklahoma, and all over the country. Um, and again, it, it also gives us a, a mechanism to collect data, to look at what's working and what's not. And there is a very specific set of core programming that we have to operate to ensure that that program is in place. It includes treatment, uh, an outpatient mental health treatment, substance use services, in-reach programming, case management services, 
coordination with mobile crisis programming, and partnerships with existing providers. So in many cases, we don't do everything but our goal is to partner with existing providers in certain communities to bridge that. So this is, an, this is an opportunity for providers that are specialists in certain areas to join and then join this process. All so, of, and I yes. gotta tell a little story on myself. You know, I worked with Val and, and we got this implemented in Missouri. I still practice there. Well, my FQHC ended up merging with the Certified <laughs> Community Bay Vale Health Center. So I have to drink my own Kool-Aid now. I work inside one <laughs> and I get emails about those performance measures asking me which patients I haven't met them for and why don't they have a wellness plan yet? And why don't they have their mandated metabolic screening? So I've, I'm on the other end of what I'm doing. Yeah, I won't, I'm not afraid to take away your quality payment. <laughs> <laughs> you see what it was like to be in front of her when she's on budget staff? <laughs> so you've both talked about very impressive outcomes data, like patient access to care up 35% by year five, yeah. and hospital costs down 14%, savings of close to $500 per person, $483.67 mm -hmm. to be precise. Valerie, is this a blip or is this saving money in Missouri? And if so, how? It's not a blip. It is saving money in Missouri and it's doing it. I mean, again, we're not new to this. We've been doing this now. We started in, I mean, 2017 budget. I mean, I think it's whenever the first mm -hmm. time we got out of our demonstration, we were actually paying clinics. And what, how it's saving money, well, first of all, just to say, I mean, if you tried to take this away in our state right now, our hospitals, our law enforcement and our schools would go to every one of our senators and representatives in our General Assembly and say, do not take this away from us. This is the only time we've ever had access like this. This is the only time law enforcement has had someone to call, somewhere to go. Those things are very, very important to them. We can get law enforcement out of a behavioral health crisis center in six minutes. So they have somebody experiencing a behavioral health crisis. They leave that person there six minutes and they're out the door doing their law enforcement job, not their mental health job. So that is, though, while we save money in hospital costs, I think those other things that we're saving, uh, time, getting people to do the, their real, all those other things that I can't even measure are really the reasons why I think I'm having more success than showing the savings on the hospital line. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was just so simple because you were doing more in the community, fewer people were ending up in the hospital. No. It's bigger. It, it, it's more. It's bigger than it's that. It's bigger, and it's keeping people from ever needing to go to the hospital or even needing to access that level of care because you're getting them early and you have, I mean, we have same day access, same day clinic right. access in Missouri. So if you walk in the door, you don't have to have an appointment, you can walk in the door in the clinic in Jefferson City and you can talk with somebody right there. And that's not a behavioral health crisis center. That's just a walk-in CCBHO clinic is all that is. And didn't your last impact report show like a 55% reduction in contact with law enforcement? Absolutely. Pre-post going into CCBHC? Absolutely. And we're never going to end <laughs> that contact. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're a fairly rural state also. But law enforcement having a solution, having knowing that they have somewhere to go. We have something that we've been able to add called the Community Behavioral Health Liaison that we use through our CCBH. We call them CCBHOs, we call them organizations because they're not locations, they're bigger than that. They're, they're, they're a community organization that helps meet services. So um, we actually have something called the Community Behavioral Health Liaison and we just launched a Youth Behavioral Health Liaison in Missouri. And their role is to liaison between all of those hot points, access points to the mental, that are currently not getting into the mental health system so that we can create that path to the mental health system because that's where we want everybody to go. So it'd be like probate judge, the sheriff. Judge, sheriff, superintendent, principal, school counselor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody. Joe, what are you seeing in other states? We, we are actually seeing similar things. Some very rural states like Oklahoma, they, uh, there's a CCBHC there that gave their local sheriff's deputy iPads so the sheriff can get a therapist online to talk to themselves or to talk to the person when they're doing a remote response. Uh, we're seeing 20% uh, reductions in both Missouri and New York in hospital utilization, 30% reductions in ER visit in both Missouri uh, and New York and New York State. And we're seeing very modest costs. What your new, our new approach in Missouri, new money in the state was what? How many million did it take to do this? Oh, 
I don't even remember because we just took the old money and repurposed it. And yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, and that's the same with our 988 money. Most of that money will run through our CCBHO option. So it's it's mirroring all that together. But I think altogether, federal and state, it was 120 yeah. or one third, two thirds. So right. that's about 40 million net. 40 million. Which is actually what Michigan asked for to do its CCBHC, 40, 45 mm -hmm. million new money, very modest price tag. And you're the same size as Missouri. You're both about 6.2, 6.1 million people, right? Uh, let's see, we saw Rhode Island asked for about 30 million to do it. So it, this is very affordable to implement compared to other programs you might do, in part because you get to repurpose other money, and in part because you can do things cheaper as a CCBHC, strangely enough. You don't have to have everything done by a licensed person. Because Pierce. your payment, yes, covers other staff. Peer support, um, peer, uh, peers are, are growing huge in Missouri. It's, mm -hmm. it's the reason we're able to help mitigate the workforce crisis that we all have today, and we all have that. But peer support, peer, spe peer support specialists are, we can pay for peer support specialists now. We were never going to be able to do that in a fee-for-service environment. I'm able to see more people when I'm seeing, when I'm doing clinic because I have a support person prepping the person, helping me with my phone calls. I used to, have to do that all as a psychiatrist. I'm the most expensive person you can do to have doing phone calls and doing follow-up on stuff like that. But you're lovely at it, Jeff. I am. You yeah. really are. And I really miss doing it so much. <laughs> but, but I think the one point that you brought up with all of this, too, is that Maryland does not have to, to build this from scratch. There are states that are doing this. Right. There is a roadmap to do this, both from the, the clinical interventions, from the mm -hmm. financing, to the other issue that's come up very often in this state, which is around the infrastructure that we would have to develop to be able to respond to this. So I'd love to hear you mention something about that. Sorry, Sheila, we didn't mean to say, yeah. You well, all are experts. <laughs> so um, the infrastructure, getting your, it's, it's a big lift. We're not gonna lie about that. Uh, but that didn't stop us from doing it. It was not in place when we started. Uh, you can pay people off spreadsheets or you said access databases, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can pay you other ways, so don't let that be the reason you don't move forward with it. And please know that we're still working on that infrastructure piece today. We're still, we are both a managed care state and a uh, non-managed care state in Missouri. So it's not even easy just to implement because we're still running in two different types of Medicaid environments as well. So you can do it. We, that was not the reason not to do it in Missouri. Mm -hmm. We figured out how to, and we're still working through how to get it done the best way possible. Unfortunately, who it hurts the most are the providers. That's where it gets the hardest. That's the heaviest lift yeah. is, is on the provider side because they're the ones that have to make the adjustments. We mostly use repurposed existing agency staff in the Department of Mental Health and in the Medicaid agency. We did bring on maybe half a dozen new people under external contract, not as full state employees. Now many of them we hired to help us implement that were recently retired agency people that knew the system inside out or recently retired state people. So they came fully trained really and with relationships, mm -hmm. but it wasn't new state employees. It was outside contract staff and it, it, it was probably half a dozen extra mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. yes. And then some contract services for the data, but all that can get funded through the PPS because PPS includes your IT costs, your software and service costs, your training costs. And Joe, your point about what PPS is? Perspective payment, it is the okay. single bundled rate you get for a service. So right now, that little payment you get for therapy, how are you gonna cover your software? How are you gonna cover your data analytics? The one rate you get for a service in a PPS has those other costs built in so the state doesn't have to do everything itself. It can make the agencies do a lot of that heavy lifting for it. And we also built into there the data collection piece, which I don't want anybody to miss out on, because it's not just about paying, but it's about all of that encounter data that is so important, what, what you did on that visit and how folks were served so that we can continue to monitor those value-based payments. And we're a state that is not really interested at this point in just giving providers COLAs year after year after year after year in the budget. We're a state that's more interested in paying for value and identifying that value through data. And our CCBHOs can build that data component into their rates so that they can then turn around and provide that data for us and hopefully get their value-based payment. And that system is used both by the agency staff 
at the providers, it's used by the Department of Mental Health, it's used by Medicaid, and the managed care companies also are able to use it to manage their part of the business. It is a shared system where the costs are borne under the prospective payment. It's a little detailed on how those cash flows work, but we can help you with that. Yeah. It's, it's, not that it's not that bad, really. Okay, unlike everyone on this stage and most of the people in this room, I am not, excuse me, I am not a mental health professional. So, Jeff, I'm not sure I understand how this way that CCBHCs pay for services, how that compares to the way Maryland pays for services now. So many of the services we just described uh, in Maryland are paid different on fee-for-service separately. So if someone comes into one of our clinics, they will see a therapist, we will charge a rate for that service. Um, and we will drop a claim with our, uh, our current ASO and, and presume we will get paid in a timely fashion. <laughs> Once that happens... A joke. That was a joke, right? <laughs> I am not saying anything. Okay. <laughs> But what, what we are also really focused, when that happens, let's say that, that I, I am a family member and I need other services as well. Um, I have to go find that service somewhere else that may not be in that clinic. Mm -hmm. The peer supports that Valerie I'll mentioned, see. that may be the place down the street that I got to go set up another meeting to go see and figure that out. Or my kid's in school and he's in, tr he's in stress now, hopefully we'll find someone either in our insurance list that might be able to see us within the next uh, two decades, or we can walk into an urgent care setting within a CCBHC. Mm -hmm. So there's this distinction between fee for service and how this is, is done, and how we're able to do this on a daily rate amongst this range of expected services. And then you might think, wow, if you get this big fat daily rate, we're gonna make a lot of money. This is a cost-based model. So we have to demonstrate our actual cost to deliver the service. Mm -hmm. And so it is, it is very different, but it's based on the calculation of, of use of all of these programs and services that we just talked about and, 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 and actually truing that up to ensure that that rate can be sustained. So basically, we take all your costs for a year, we divide it by the number of visits you deliver in a year of the kind you decide you're gonna make a payment for. And if you do one of those services in a day, you get that payment. Now, if you go cheap and you start, you know, thinning out the porridge too much and using cheaper staff and not giving the visit, it gets rebased every other year. Well, if you do it cheap, then your rate goes down next time. Joe, you have worked with behavioral health bureaucracies in a lot of states. What are the biggest anxieties? The biggest anxieties are, first of all, it's hard to change. It's, it's, it is a little complicated model. We've been explaining it right now. People are anxious that uh, the cost will go out of control, that everybody will start doing it, and we've not seen that in any states. They're anxious the rate will go up every year. We've not seen that in any of the 10 states, now about 12 that have implemented. It stays about stable. They're worried that they'll start doing a lot more visits, but they don't do that because then they'll get their rate cut later because the visits go too cheap. The one thing we do see is a lot more access. The only way to be a big success is to serve more people. You can't be a big success in this by going cheap and you can't be a big success just by giving more visits. You have to see more people. But they are anxious about the money control. They're anxious about the money control. Valerie, you're nodding. Well, I what, <laughs> what, what particular anxieties do you see in Missouri? I do see anxiety around the money control. We still have anxiety around the money control even though we have cost reports for so many years. and. And actually this year, we are not rebasing our cost reports this year, we are actually doing a Medicare economic index increase. So the providers will get an increase this year, but it'll be tied to Me Medicare's economic index number. So that's their increase this year. Then we'll rebase cost reports next year and see where we're at again. Uh, but that's one of the things that I, everybody thinks that, that it's gonna go, the costs are gonna be out of control. And that's really not anything that we've seen in Missouri. I've not had to go back in and ask for <coughs> huge supplemental budget requests. I've had to ask for zero supplemental budget requests through all of this. That, isn't, that has not happened. Um, and I also haven't had to ask for huge new decision items in the next budget year to fund the caseload growth in these agencies. In fact, our behavioral health caseload growth is still relatively s small overall, even though we are serving so many more people. So They're also worried that they'll get uh, incompetent providers. Oh, that, we, that, we that, do avoid that. Yeah, that, that's a big worry, but what protects you there are the certification criteria. 
and just the sheer requirements to even get in the door. You have to be a pretty competent agency just to meet the mark to get started. And we have not seen in any of the states that have implemented it uh, in the demonstration or subsequently that it's run away with all these new providers, many of which aren't really doing the right thing. And I will just add to that because at, when we started, all of our substance use providers wanted to be CCBHOs. All of our CMHCs wanted to be CCBHOs. They got into the criteria of what it took to be those things and realized they needed to stay in their lane. They were good in their lane and that's what they needed to focus on. We got enough business to go around for everybody. So we still have CMHCs operating in Missouri that will not become CCBHOs. And we have many substance use providers that will not become CCBHOs. We got plenty of business. To and later yeah. I'll ask you to sort all those acronyms out for me. <laughs> but I want to, yeah. as I alluded, we have invited two power players in Maryland health policy to give us their thoughts about this conversation. Um, so let me introduce them. I'm going to ask each of them to join us here on stage. First, I want to introduce my state delegate, who happens also to chair the House Health and Government Operations Committee and serve on the Maryland Medicaid Advisory Committee. Jocelyn Pena Melnick has represented <laughs> Prince George's. Jocelyn has represented Prince George's and Anne Arundel counties in the House of Delegates since 2007. She earned her law degree from the State University of New York at Buffalo, and then she pursued a legal career both as a defense attorney and as an assistant U.S. attorney prosecuting criminal cases. Welcome, Jocelyn. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. And I'm so excited, I can't even turn the page. The, <laughs> we are excited to welcome Dr. Laura Herrera-Scott, who has joined the Moore administration as the acting secretary of the Maryland Department of Health. Dr. Herrera-Scott brings both public and private sector experience to the job. She has worked as a vice president at Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, as medical director of population and community health at Johns Hopkins Healthcare, and as deputy secretary Secretary of Public Health under former Governor Martin O'Malley. Thank you so much for joining us. And Dr. Herrera, Scott, as I said, the, the, the Mental Health Association of Maryland is thrilled that you are here with us for this conversation. And as a board member, let me say that we look forward to working very closely with you on all kinds of issues that affect people, the mental health of people in Maryland. So let me right now ask you for your reaction to this conversation. So first I want to say it's four weeks on the job. <laughs> <laughs> and she's doing fine. And I'm not a psychiatrist by training. I was a primary care provider. When I practice, I only practice HIV. So 70% of my patients had a comorbid mental health or substance use issue. So I treated it as a primary care. Um, you know, certainly uh, being new, I'm aware of the five sites that we have and the funding that they've gotten from SAMHSA. We've been assured by CMS and SAMHSA that there will be additional funds that come in time before the expiration of the grant funds that are there. But as was mentioned already, it's certainly uh, an important component of primary behavioral health care. Um, Maryland, I think, is rich in assets. We have a lot of... Um, resources, but they're not connected in a continuum of care, so to speak, the way we see on the physical health side. And so in the four weeks I've been here, that's certainly something I'm looking at, is how do we start connecting the resources we have to create that continuum of care, of which the CCBHCs, as we think about primary behavioral health, are one component of that continuum. In addition, as a you know, ex-public health, now doing public health again. I want to go upstream, as was mentioned, I think, by your speech and the work you've done with ACES. And what do we need to do to impact that from um, parenting to childhood trauma to um, uh, education in the school system? But how do we go even more upstream so we're not building a pipeline to meet the needs of these patients when we can prevent it or mitigate it early on. So, so very interested in them, but for me it's, it's one piece of, of a larger puzzle that we need to figure out. Thank you for, the, for those comments. Let me turn to you, Delegate Pena Melnick. And I can help connect that. 
because in Maryland this year we have a bill that I am, I started working on it this past summer um, and I actually brought the, uh, all the advocates and whether you're against it or um, you know, uh, for it to come to the table to discuss it. And it's a bill that is titled the Behavioral Health Model for Maryland, Senate Bill 582 and House Bill 1148. So um, Delegate Moon has it in the House. I requested him to put in the bill because it has a criminal justice component as well. And then uh, Senator Malcolm Augustine has it in the Senate. And what the bill does is that it seeks to address access to behavioral health services as a continuing, like as you stated, and focus on the needs of individual at all points of entry. Um, the reason why I thought of the bill was because we tend to react in the legislature and we do great with all of you. Um, and I see wonderful colleagues um, uh, in, the, uh, in the audience today that are my mentors and work so hard, um, like Senator Kelly um, and, and Maggie, who I love, both of you. Um, but we piecemeal things. And I think that we need to look at behavioral health in a comprehensive way, in a holistic way. Instead of doing this program for three million, doing this program for four million, right. let's look at Maryland, bring all the experts together, which is what this bill does. It brings all the experts, the Department of Health, right? The judiciary, behavioral health care professionals and providers, insurance, consumers, and advocates to look at the short-term and long-term recommendations regarding behavioral health in Maryland. Where are the holes? How can we fill them? So the bill establishes a commission, right, that is consistent of representatives from the Maryland Department of Health and everyone else that I mentioned, and they are going to, uh, it's a four-year commission, come together and make recommendations that make sense to us. Um, the bill includes work groups that will focus on specific populations like children, right? Children that are waiting in the hospitals for months. They cannot get a placement. It will look at the infrastructure and different ways that we can finance the programs and address the workforce shortage because that is a big issue. In addition, the bill also will require, and you will love this, the Maryland Department of Health to submit a waiver application to CMS to expand certified community behavioral health clinics. So we are on it and it is in the bill. The bill also has um, a provision that will require value-based care as well for behavioral health. And it's, if I may say myself in a humble way, it's a good bill. <laughs> um, and we are, you know, and it comes from years of experience of looking at where the holes are. But again, as the secretary said, and I'm so honored to be here with all of you, but I'm so uh, happy to work with an administration that will come and testify and give us position on the bills. And this week, we had something that has never happened. We had the Secretary of Health and the Secretary of DHS, which are both Latinos, by the way, <laughs> testify together. What a concept, right? <laughs> you know, that's hard for me to do. <laughs> um, I, I'm filled with so many thoughts, but one of them is, why does it take four years to study this? Because a lot of these um, items are big, right? And we don't want to say this is what you need to do. These, these are the experts that will come and have discussions and try to come with a plan that makes sense. And it takes time to implement things. And it takes money. And that's, and, and you know, a lot of this stuff takes millions of dollars. And we have so many other things that are competing. So we need the data to justify and shame us to do it, right? And it takes time to do those things. There are some low-hanging fruits in the bill that we're gonna do now, but we need a term to give this administration time to get their bearings, right? Because we're putting a lot of pressure on them so that they can get it right. Secretary Herrera-Scott, have you heard anything in this presentation that surprised you? 
No, nothing that surprised me. I will say that Valerie graciously introduced herself to me, and then when I realized who she was, she has agreed graciously <laughs> to meet with me after just to learn from what Missouri has done. So we've already established that just at the table. So no surprises. It's just some of, you know, the devil is always in the details and figuring out things. We have a very antiquated, uh, payment system, which many of you know. Um, as was already mentioned, we have an ASO that we're having some issues with. Um, so we're try So, But I can so say, as she can, it was not this administration. <laughs> <laughs> so we have some details that we need to sort through, and, and Valerie has already graciously agreed to meet with me and her team afterwards to, to get some lessons learned from Missouri so we're not reinventing the wheel here. As, as Delegate Penny Melnick said, you're on it. <laughs> She's on it. And I'm on the fact that, as I said, we're all that stands between you and a great reception. So I, I want to take five minutes, one minute for each of you to ask for one closing idea that you think is important for us to take with us. Valerie, I'm going to throw it to you oh, first. Good, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't, you know, don't do it because it's not perfect. We, we were one of the first states. We have the most clinics in the country. Um, you build the plane in the air all the time. We do that all the time in government. So don't be afraid of it because it's not going to be perfect because it's not going to be perfect. But it made a huge difference in our state and I wouldn't undo it. Build the plane in the air. Okay, Jeff Richardson, what, what, what thoughts should we carry with us from this? We have momentum. We've been hearing about this all night. Let's not lose it. You gave 30 seconds back. That's great. Joe Parks, what yeah. should we carry with us? You are actually much better positioned in the current development of your system, in the size of your state, and in the internal relationships you have to execute on this than several other states who have already executed on it. You are better positioned, you're developed enough, you can pull this off, you should not worry as much as you're worrying. <laughs> Delegate Penya Melnick. I would say that the legislature is ready, the Senate, the House. We are not afraid to be first at all. We're very creative and we are happy that we have a partner in, on the second floor that will make things so much easier. Secretary Her Herrera Scott. Um, to steal shamelessly. So as soon as I'm able to tap into what Missouri <laughs> has right. done, figure out how we can do it here. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you all, but I feel like I learned so much and I've picked up more of this energy and enthusiasm that we've been talking about. So I want to thank all of our panelists. Let's thank them again. Some of you longtime attendees may notice that I skipped a step. I didn't invite questions from the floor because it was kind of a choice of questions or food, but I suspect <laughs> that some of our panelists would hang around if you've got if you want to ask them something and i appreciate your attention thank you all